fermentation processes, canning, mm-hmm. is that part of a fermentation process? Canning oh, your I'm food? so glad you said that. No. And no? I hate to, oh. I hate to be, um, I hate to say this because so many people are sort of in that homesteading mind space and everybody's canning now. And, you know, so it was a big thing during COVID too. Um, the good thing about canning is that you are taking control of some sort of food processing step in your own home and, and you're taking food from the farmer's market from your own garden and you're canning it, you're keeping it and doing it. all of that is absolutely wonderful. But from a nutritional perspective, you're not maximizing what you can do to that food. In fact, you're 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 making it it worse. The term pickling, when and when we think about making for many of us think about making pickles, we're taking a cucumber, we get some vinegar, we get some sugar, we heat it up and we put it in it. That's not pickling. Pickling actually refers to historically to, to fermenting. When we ferment, right, what we're doing is we're allowing in, in almost all cases the wild bacteria that's in on the vegetables, in the air, on tables, on surfaces to um, come alive, eat the sugars and the starches that are in the vegetables. In, in the case of vegetable ferments, it produces lactic acid as a byproduct. There's also a lot of chemical and physical reactions taking place that start to pre-digest the food. There's often an increase of nutrients. Depending on the vegetable and the toxin, it's also a great way to detoxify certain vegetables, uh, prepares them for human consumption, and it also produces incredibly uh, pleasant aromas, flavors, and textures in our food, um, and also makes them safer from not only a toxin perspective, but from a pathogenic perspective, and also allows them to store for uh, a lot longer. There's all incredible benefits of fermentation. The reason that it uh, makes it makes the food safer from a storage perspective and from a pathogenic perspective is as the bacteria eat the sugars and the starches, uh, it creates lactic acid, and that means it becomes more acidic. So the pH drops. So on a on a um, now in your pH scale, seven is neutral. As your as your numbers get higher, it becomes more basic or um, alkaline. And as your numbers drop, as your numbers get lower than seven, it becomes more acidic. When you start getting in the, you know, if seven is neutral, like water, and you start getting into the, the fours, for example, it becomes a very safe environment that's um, hostile to pathogenic you know, pathogens um, and very uh, welcoming to the bacteria, the good bacteria, the kind that populate our guts. So, uh, and that's the other benefit of, of fermented foods is you're at, when you when you eat them, you're you're filling your bodies with all sorts of amazing, wonderful, uh, you know, live probiotics. So that's how the fermentation part works. When we can, um, we're doing two things often. When we when we make pickles, like artificial pickles, um, like most people, if you if you Google how to make a pickle, you know, and your plastic pickles and all that, what they do is they take vinegar, and the reason you put the vinegar in there is because you immediately drop that pH into that safe zone by the introduction of the, of the vinegar, but you're not doing any of those other wonderful things. You're not pre-digesting it. You're not creating all that wonderful microflora and the good bacteria that populate your gut. You're doing none of those things. You're only dropping the, um, the pH artificially by adding that vinegar. The second problem is with canning itself, you, you could make the argument that when you, when you can something, at the moment you're finished canning it, from a, a pathogen perspective, it's the safest the food can possibly be. Not from a nutritional perspective or any of that, but from a pathogenic perspective, um, it's the safest it could possibly be. But that canning process doesn't discriminate between good and bad uh, microorganisms. It kills everything. So you, you create this like, the, the way I like to explain it is, it's like there's two armies on a field, right, battling one another. And then you drop a bomb in the middle of that field and you kill both armies, the good army and the bad army, everybody's dead. And now that field is, you know, is safe from, 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 from the armies, but the bad army could have reinforcements hiding in the woods and they come onto that field and there's nothing fighting those reinforcements. It's the same thing when you can something or you pasteurize something or you use antibiotics, you just, you've, you've, you've leveled that plant, you've killed everything off good and bad. And for a second, as far as pathogens are concerned, it's incredibly safe. But as soon as something breaks down in that system and a pathogen can find its way in, there's nothing stopping it. There's no good bacteria that's helping with anything. There's nothing fighting it off. It's a blank slate. And 
you know, all sorts of, of bad things can happen. So we don't can anything whatsoever. Any, any vegetable processing that we do um, involves fermentation. And it's a, it's, it's an incredible way to, again, connect with your food on a, you know, on a very ancestral way, but also to start to understand how these millions and trillions of microorganisms that's on your countertops, on your skin, on your food can be harnessed to work in concert with you to create incredibly nourishing food. And that's where I usually send people first. Like if you want to start, you know, what, take, take your first step, make sauerkraut, like just make sauerkraut. It's incredibly easy. We have, I have information in my book about it. If anybody's looking for another really, really, really good resource, um, I would send them to a book called Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz. I think it's the most accessible, um, empowering, just basics of home fermentation you can possibly find. Okay. I've been canning like a wild woman these past couple of weeks. <laughs> well, and my reasoning, I live on the West coast of Canada mm -hmm. and there's farmer farmers markets everywhere. We're, we're in a location that's only accessible by ferry, but it is on the mainland. Um, so I'm like, I'm going to get all the produce from the farm stands from the local farms, can it. And then I don't have to buy much from the grocery store through the winter because a lot of our produce comes from the States, this whole appeal thing, you know, the mm -hmm. appeal thing. So that that's been kind of my process behind it. And it's been fun and all that kind of stuff. So with like cucumbers, beets, carrots, all that, can you ferment them? It, just every one of them, a hundred percent. Oh, really? Okay. This is how basic it is. And, I, and I'm so glad you brought this up. So again, please understand, I am not dissing canning. You haven't there's, killed there's my wonderful canning things dream. Of, what's that? <laughs> you haven't killed my canning dream. Okay. <laughs> because again, <laughs> the fact that you can preserve local produce, you can connect with it, you can you can do all these wonderful things. That, that's all amazing. But if you're looking to maximize the nutrients and the flavors and the textures and the aromas of these foods, then fermentation is is, is a much better option. So uh, let's take cucumbers, for example. To me, the magic number in, in vegetable ferments is 2%. There's, excuse me, there's two primary ways to take vegetables and, and ferment them. So number one, you, you always have to put this kind of fermentation is an anaerobic fermentation it means it happens in the absence of oxygen. So you always have to submerge it under some sort of a liquid. Uh, so that's number one. And then two ways to do that is either to do it like you would do pickles where you put the cucumbers themselves in a brine that, you know, water you've already prepared, or like in the, term, in the form of sauerkraut, you're shredding that vegetable up and you're with the salt, you're drawing the moisture out of the vegetable and uh, submerging it under its own liquid. Okay. So th those are the two major ways of doing it. Um, with cucumbers, for example, and, and, and it's, in both cases, it's a 2% brine. And this is where um, there's some, there's some discrepancy in the fermenting world, but I want to make it very easy for everybody here. Number one, you don't ferment in metal unless it's stainless steel. Uh, ideally, you're fermenting in ceramic or you're fermenting in glass. Those are the two major places to ferment. Typically as well, you don't want to ferment, especially a long ferment in plastic. If you do ferment in plastic at all, you want to make sure it's incredibly high grade restaurant level plastic. That's not going to leach all sorts of nasty things out. But for most people at home, a big mason jar is, is, is good enough uh, or a big glass jar. They're, they're easy to get. Not the weight of the vessel the weight of everything inside of that vessel, you, you figure out what that weight is, you multiply it by 2% and that's how much salt you add. It literally is that simple. So the easiest way to ferment a cucumber is you take a, a jar, you, you, know, you weigh the jar so you can account for the weight of the jar, fill it with as many cucumbers as you want, put in enough water so they're submerged, you weigh the combination of water and cucumbers together, multiply it by 2%, add that much salt, and literally that's all you have to do. Then you can start playing with, you're going to add coriander and you're going to add dill or whatever else to flavor the pickles, but that's all you have to do. Sit it on the counter. In an ideal situation, we like to ferment uh, at about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, but it will ferment in a much larger range than that. But when we ferment here, we have actually a refrigerator we have set up for 60, between 62 to 65 degrees, we ferment. Uh, sauerkraut, the only thing you have to do is take the cabbage, shred it, put it, pack it, 
oh, I'm sorry, shred it, weigh it, multiply it by 2%, add that much salt, massage all the salt in, pack it super tight into a jar. Because the salt draws the moisture out, the, the sauerkraut is sitting under the level of the liquid that's come out of it. And you ferment. You can add things like juniper berries and bay leaves and onions and apple slices, whatever you want. But that's the basis of, of, of how to do it. And that's it. And you at about 65 degrees, most of our ferments take about 10 days. They're completely done. We ferment carrot sticks. Uh, we cut up the carrot sticks. We pack them into a jar super tight We uh, so they hold each other down. We fill it with water, weigh the contents of that jar, the combination of the carrots and the water together, add 2% salt and let it ferment. And they become this incredible live probiotic snack for our kids. That also, by the way, the other cool thing about fermentation is if you're on sort of a ketogenic or low carb diet, the food for the bacteria or is the sugars that's inside of the vegetables. So a fermented carrot stick has less sugar in it than the carrot itself does. And it's full of probiotics. It tastes better. It stores longer. And um, it's already partially digested. So our bodies work less hard to get the nutrients from it. I'm going to try that. I'm going to give it a go. I'll have my canning and fermenting going on side in the kitchen. <laughs> and well, I, I mean, I've done it a ton of canning already. So I'll, I'll give the fermenting a go. How long does the fermented food last for? That's a great question. So I have eaten. So once you ferment, this is the one drawback, unless you have a cellar of the fermenting uh, versus the canning. It, fermenting works great again in the mid sixties. It works fine at 70, it works fine at 80. I fermented at 90 degrees. And again, this is all Fahrenheit. But once you get to the flavor and the texture that you want, the I, you know, where it is, and this depends on you know your own preference. The way to sort of lock in that flavor and texture in a row is to stick it in the refrigerator. So it does take some refrigerator space. Uh, if you have a cool basement, you can ferment it for a, it can stay down there for a lot longer as well. But it, um, I have eaten sauerkraut that I've made and then stuck in the refrigerator that is two years old, and it's changed a little bit, but it's absolutely still safe. 